This is Father Steve Hasso, pastor of All Saints. He's a folk here up on the north side. Ramon Romero, state representative, District 90. The first Hispanic representative from Tarrant County to the state. First, <laughs> this was a phenomenon. He unseated Lon Burnham, who was the longest serving state representative in Texas. He unseated him, and now he's serving his second term. And the first term, after the first term two years ago, he was elected as the, what do you call him, the freshman, the best freshman state representative by the Democrats. Marie Louise Garcia, Tarrant County Clerk, first Latina elected to a countywide position. Never been done before. She's currently in office, local individual. Uh, district judges, Ruben Gonzalez, currently he's in that position. Uh, Jesse, excuse me, Jesus, Jesse Nevadas, he's currently a district judge as well. He's in criminal court, I believe this guy is in federal court. And I'm sorry I couldn't find the picture of him. Judge Pete Pettis, one of the first judges that we have. Mr. Pettis truly went to, through a trial of fire when he became judge. Uh, <coughs> he was one of the first. Judge Baldettis was also another judge who was on, in office. When he was a judge, though, um, he really went through some humiliating experiences as a judge by the district attorney's office. He was um, one, of the, one of the young attorneys who said, I'm assigned to the Supreme Court of Mexico because he was there. He was belittled, they didn't like him, and they just went on and ragged him. It, it just shows the powerlessness sometimes, even though you have a, he had a law degree, of course, <coughs> in spite of the fact that he had the credentials, they continued to demean this man during the time of his service when he was, he was in that position. And he was elected into that district judge position. He eventually, consequently, got unelected but, I mean, that's, this is still a sore point among a lot of Latinos, and especially among the Bar Mexican-American Bar Association, about the treatment that this man had to suffer during the time that he was a judge. He's still alive. He's still around. So what does this lead us to? Voting, voting, voting. Latinos tend to not vote in the numbers comparable. Uh, we just need to, to get our act together. I've been standing here, and I've been sitting in your way. I apologize. Can you see? <laughs> Throw out this whole thing. So, you see this t-shirt here? You see, and you may probably not see it, Cesar Chavez. Voting is very important. These are activists, uh, Jody Perry, this is Delsa Perez, one of the persons who contributed to this, and other activists who have really promoted to vote, vote, vote. We really stress that. In spite of our stressing it, we still have a problem in getting our folks to the voting booths to, to get them to vote in their numbers. Uh, this is a march, and I'll go over that in a bit, but this is Main Street, and we're marching in protest of some immigration laws that were being proposed back in 2006. You notice the whiteness of the crowd? The message that went out is there will be no other flag than the United States flag carried in this march, except for the Lone Star. I think the Lone Star is out there. And we will all wear white. And third, we will not say a word. It'll be a silent march. And so you had 20,000 people walking down Main Street, quiet, walking, 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 until, of course, we got to the main square. But we are not a criminal. Even the nuns came out. <coughs> and then we rallied here, said the Pledge of Allegiance, <coughs> and basically exposed that we need to be part of this country and we need to get rid of discriminatory immigration laws. Some other happenings, Chris Bonilla was the first page, Latino page. He tells me the story that he was working in the same building as Jim Wright. Jim Wright at that time was a congressman and you had to get his permission to be a page. And he said, he told a buddy, man, I think I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd like to become a page. And the guy told him, scoffed, nah. You're not going to make it. 
Boy, he should have said that. Yeah. Oh, really? He went right up to Jim Wright's office, knocked on the door, went in. What does it take for me to become a page? Signed him up. That's all it took. All it took. He went up there. And Jim Wright said, well, yeah, why not? We need a page. Became the first Latino page. He's now a successful land developer today in Fort Worth. He has the Bonilla, it's called the Bonilla Company. And the first Latina, Jackie Valenciano, with Jim Wright, became the first Latina page out of Fort Worth. Born and raised in Fort Worth. <coughs> Churches. That's St. Uh, Patrick. And St. Patrick is the, as I said back in 1895, the first Catholic church in Fort Worth. Um, churches have been played a big influence. All Saints, we talked about All Saints. But you're talking about a low income, struggling, but yet devout population. So if you're struggling with these obstacles, economic obstacles, discrimination, being away from a country that you've been familiar with, and you're coming here and you're working hard, you devote on your family and you also depend on your religious faith to keep you going, that there's got to be a reason why. How do I survive through all this? How do I stay strong? How do I stay true? Because you can go into drinking, you can go into violence, you can go all kinds of cra crazy behavior because of the stress that comes with struggling day in and day out. And our heritage is the very one that's devout, that, that depends on faith. And so what happened was, they brought their faith with them. And the Catholic Church, not only the Catholic, and I'll show you other religions, that went ahead and said, you need help, and we are here to serve you and continue to nourish your spiritual, spiritual faith. So All Saints opened up, and you know the story about San Jose. So San Jose opened up, and here there was an outlet for people to gather, socialize, and support one another. This is a court um, that was at San Jose, queen of the court. And here's another mutual, it's called La Sociedad Mutualista, Social Mutual Society, Mutual Aid Society. One of their primary functions was to collect dues. So when they went on, one of the members died, they could pay for the funeral. So they would have a decent burial. That's how they gathered their money, one of the reasons they gathered, but also to help people who needed assistance. San Jose School, they eventually knocked down that wooden structure and built a building and then the nuns came in and as well as the priests, there's three nuns here to provide education, Catholic private school education to these children. And here's a graduation, kindergarten. <laughs> Uh, there was a mission, Our Lady of Guadalupe mission in 1848. What happened was, after World War II, there was a real, uh, in the growth of the population, they decided to break that invisible barrier down, break that wall, break that wall down, <laughs> and they crossed it and moved over into the west side of Main Street, all the way up to what they call La Loma, which is far north side, into Diamond Hill. So once the population started moving there, the Catholic faith followed them and opened a mission. This is the bishop of Dallas. This was one diocese. Dallas and Fort Worth were together. So they opened up that mission. They eventually got ahead and opened a full-fledged church called Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1956. Now, this is on the north side. The Lady of Guadalupe is a very spiritual and important um, belief in, in, in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In Mary. Uh, these are Knights of Columbus. If you're Catholic, you know what these people are. They're honorary guards. <coughs> and um, here's the recreation of the Indian Juan Diego, the priest, the bishop, Bishop Montufor, because the story is that Mary appeared to this Indian boy. This happened, by the way, remember we talked about the conquest of, of Mexico? This happened like 30 years after the conquest the Franciscans were wanting to convert all the Indians to Catholicism. They were having a difficult time. And what happened was this miracle happened. Mary came and she was what they call her morena. Morena means she was dark. 
She wasn't white. She looked like an Indian. She appeared to him in December to this young boy. And he said, he ran and told the, the bishop, I saw a vision. I saw Mary. He says, you need more proof. And so he went back and he said, uh, the bishop doesn't believe me. He says, I'll give you this cloak. And this was in December. Take the cloak to the bishop. But tell the bishop, I want a church here built. The boy went back. Here's the cloak. And when he opened the cloak up, it was roses fell out of that cloak. In December, roses don't grow in Mexico City. So the bishop says, it's a sign. It is true. So they built a bishop, uh, built a church. If you've been to Mexico City, it's called the Basilica de Guadalupe. And they still have that image of the tilma, which is the, what the Aztecs used to wear, this garment here. They still have the image there in the church. So you can, you can watch it, but they have a conveyor belt because they don't want you standing there. So you get on this conveyor belt and you're looking at it like that. You can get back on the conveyor belt, but they don't want you hogging it. So you're looking at it like, anyway. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Lady Guadalupe, they have Jamaicas. Jamaicas is a word for a festival. And this is from our Lady of Guadalupe. You can see back in 1970, they're promoting, come out to Lady Guadalupe Church. Ah, this is what I really like. This is St. Patrick, right? They're coming out. And look at this gentleman here. Look at this gentleman here. You can see they're distinctly dressed, right? This is truly Spanish. The guitar the charro outfit, this is Mexican Indian. They call them matechines. And so what, in Mexico what happened is the Indians weren't that quick to give up their religion. All right, so they blended the two. Remember the Indian, appear, uh, the Virgin Mary appeared to an Indian boy? Well, that got the Aztecs who were defeated to be converted but you got my heart and got my soul, but I didn't get rid of all my customs. And I did not become a Spaniard. I still held on to my Indian ways, my Indian dress. I will worship Mary, I will worship Jesus and God and the Gospels and the Apostles, but I want to do it my way. And my way means that I hold on to my Indian customs to the point that when we have a procession, this happened at the uh, Colosseum, that I'm going to wear my little uh, bow and arrow, I'm going to carry Mary, but I'm going to come in dressed. And this is an image of the Virgin Mary as she appeared, supposedly. Now, think back again. You see how faith is so strong with Latinos and how it's so important to sustain them, and it continues today. San Mateo, it's a mission church. It was opened up in 1941. St. Patrick Cathedral, you know where St. Patrick is, downtown? This is located in a place called TP. TP meaning Texas and Pacific. And there were people who lived there in order to go work on the Texas Pacific line. So the neighborhood was formed such that, just like Our Lady, of Guad just like Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, just like San Jose, St. Patrick decided to open up a mission church on San Mateo in 1941. It, was, it didn't look this way when it started. But later, as years went on, they started adding and adding, putting money into it. They built it until the current bishop, Bishop Olson, said, that's it. We need to close it. Because that's only a mission church. Mission. We're on a mission. The mission's over. And all the people that go to that church can now come to St. Patrick. The reason they built this originally is the t people in TP had to walk three miles to get to St. Patrick on Sundays. Rain or shine, rain or shine, you walk three miles and then walk three miles back. They said, nah, let's build a church. There's a, obviously a congregation there. So the bishop said, now, uh, there's not enough people in, t in TP any longer to sustain the church. Well, what, what happened was the people there, even though they were grown and moved away, there were still people who were living there and their families, they were baptized there, they were confirmed there, they were married there. They still had very strong emotional ties to that church to the point that they were sustaining the church 
They were contributing money to that church, even though they may not have been going there every Sunday, nor going church there every Sunday. So what happened is, right now you have a current controversy in the bishop saying, this church is closed, and it is. They put a lock on this church. The last mass was in November. They, it's shut down. So what happened is, well, this is uh, an example of one for fundraising that they had there. As you can see, there was a quite a number of people that were supporting that. So what happened is, once they were locked out, people started coming back and saying, we're not putting up with this, to the point where they have already contacted an attorney who is familiar with canon law, canon law being the church, the church law. And the church is now being sued by some of the congregation members to open that church back up. To the point that Americo, this gentleman here, he took, he went to Rome two months ago. And you know how the Vatican Guard comes out with all those big old costuming things? Swiss Guard. Swiss Guard, I'm sorry, the Swiss Guard. They show him, and somebody took a video of him, that he jumped over the barricade, walked over to the Swiss Guard, I've got a letter for the Pope. It was an appeal to the Pope, please give this to the Pope. And the guard went like this, <clears throat> and they said, but you need to get back. And he went back. So they even went to Rome to appeal to the Pope. So now it's still under deliberation. But again, this gentleman's name is Fred Flores. He's one of the leaders of this group. But you can't go in. The reason they met outside is because you can't go in. This is after they've contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep this church open. And it is controversial now. Again, what does that attest to? It attests to the strong faith and belief. And it also attests that they are not any longer meek and compliant people, even to the point where they're willing to challenge the church. Wesley, you know, the, the Methodists, they opened up a, an outfit of an, a settlement house in, in Fort Worth. And here are the ladies who came out to do good work. And they started teaching the children. They had clinics, health clinics, but they, re what they really had, and I'll show you this in a minute, <clears throat> they had cooking classes, they had knitting classes, they had uh, preschool education. Uh, the same thing here, kindergarten. <clears throat> you can hardly see this. It says, the goal, the objective of of our work is to help development, development of Christian American citizens. <laughs> the settlement house movement in the United States swept through the early, 19th, early 20th century. One of the primary reasons is to Americanize the immigrants, is to Americanize you, to get you used to the customs. That was still the mission of the Wesley group when they went out there to the to the north side. Knitting, they even encourage music, uh, cooking. Now it's not that, as you know, they like Mexican food, you know, we like, that was not the reason why they gave them cooking classes. The reason they gave them cooking classes is that there was malnutrition going on in the community because they weren't buying, they didn't have access to the good diets. So what they wanted to show them is how to make do with what you have and to provide nutritious meal for your children so they don't become malnourished, so they don't get depleted on vitamins. <clears throat> um, uh, this is Mary Lou Lopez who used to work for the Wesley Foundation. The only reason I put this up here, not only because she's an outstanding woman, she basically says, the Wesley Foundation helped me, this was an activity place that I came and learned, uh, but my husband doesn't want me to work, uh, he, he just, even though I'm smart, but he says, no, you stayed home. Well, she really didn't stay at home. She volunteered, and she became a mover and groover and activist in the Latino community. But this is what bothers me. Pasco girl shot in head leaving convenience store. That was a Latina who was killed by other Latinos. This one here, you can hardly see it, but there was a shooting and a killing of a Latino at a dance after in the, in the parking lot. So the newspaper elected to wrap this very good story 
about this woman who's working in the community, a Latina, <coughs> who's doing good work. You can see the Aztec symbol here with this story about what happens, that there's violence still in the community. You see the, the dichotomy, the good and the bad that sometimes happens in these communities? That's what the newspaper tried to show, I think, in this, in this instance. Uh, another is a Presbyterian in La Corte. Uh, this gentleman, Pastor Guillermo Walls, he was born in Mexico, but I don't, I don't remember how he got the name Walls. But La Corte was done in 1935. Um, he was there, this picture was taken in 1935, but he presided there in 1925 to 1949. He did good works. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I was going to brag about this. I started this organization, but we don't need to talk about it. <laughs> <coughs> this gentleman is very distinguished, as well as this one. This is Gilbert Garcia, a local guy who formed this organization, uh, American GF. Now, this gentleman started, he is a surgeon uh, who went to serve in World War II. Uh, this is interesting. He was a surgeon, graduated from medical school, and they sent him to the infantry. He served in the African, in Africa, North Africa. He fought. He was a, a lieutenant. He gave him an officer position, and he fought against the African Corps in North, in North Africa. And I guess they figured out, wait a minute, why are we sending a surgeon into the infantry? So they switched, switched him later into, um, into the medical corps, so he ended up serving in Italy, and treating the, the people that were killed, uh, the soldiers that were killed. But after he came back, and this is a common experience, after you've, after you've taken them off to the farm and they've seen gay Paris, they're not going back. <laughs> so a lot of the young Latinos who went to serve in World War II came back and said, we know what dictatorship is. We've seen it. We fought against it. We fought against Hitler. We fought against the Japanese. We know what that's all about. And the authority, why in the world are we going to settle for that here in the United States? Why in the world would we, after we're risking our lives, and some of us losing our lives, resort to living in a second-class citizenship status? And they said, no way. So they formed the American GI Forum. And notice the word American. They wanted to be sure that anybody sees them, that they knew that they were patriotic. So this is um, Jim Wright's there. Um, this guy was a local representative. Felix Longoria. I'm not going to go into deep measure. This is gentleman uh, was one of the heroes. He got killed in Japan, but they wouldn't allow his family to have a wake at the Kennedy funeral home in Three Rivers, Texas. So the wife contacted uh, Fil uh, excuse me, um, Hector Garcia. He intervened and then contacted LBJ, Linda Baines Johnson. Linda Baines Johnson intervened and had him buried at Arlington National Cemetery because they wouldn't bury him in Texas, in Three Rivers, Texas. Excuse me. They wouldn't hold a wake. They didn't want to deal with him. They would have buried him on the Mexican side of the cemetery. You know there was, even in death, there was segregation. The American, the white side and the, and the Mexican side. <coughs> this is um, a local fellow, Fernando Gonzalez, and I won't talk about him. I have to show you this one. <coughs> Why am I doing all this? It's to show you again that we're born here in the United States, or those of us who are immigrants, we still love this country. This is my father. He served in Germany in 1945. <coughs> this is a uh, Remember, Medico Perez's name, he's the uh, owner of a lot of these photos. This is his son. He was in Afghanistan at Fort Leatherneck. One of the interesting things, though, you see this, uh, these CDs on top of this machine gun? Remember that, that Nietzsche signs and Leo signs? This is our CD. He took Fort Worth with him. <laughs> so while he was fighting the, the Taliban, them shooting him. He was listening to the CD, <laughs> reminding him of Fort Worth. <laughs> In fact, he was from the TP area, <laughs> reminding him of TP <laughs> while he was fighting. I mean, that's a common experience that GIs do, right? They want to remember their home. 
while we're in the midst of hell. And that's the same with him. Um, some other organizations, the International Good Neighbor, uh, Manu Hara. Uh, this is Judge Valdez. He was the, one of the first judges in Tarrant County. Uh, other organizations, Ballet Folklorico, uh, that's still in existence. And this is just a demonstration of who they are. Uh, LULAC, League of United Latin American Citizens, uh, Hispanic Debutante Association. This is an organization that wanted to promote Latinas going into college, so they raised scholarships. The debutante is like what it sounds like, they're coming out. And so they had a court, and they would raise money, encourage young ladies to not settle for staying at home or having babies and all that other stuff, but really go on and be, live to your potential. Um, this is an interesting group, Hispanic Women's Network. Uh, the co-founder of the Hispanic Women's Network is in our presence, Ms. Rita Utt. She's right here. But you see the young ladies, young professional ladies? You see Jennifer Treveño, who's now running for city council? Very much of a dynamic organization that promotes the advancement of females. <coughs> Other, just go through it because I know we're short in time and I've spoken quite a bit. Or have I already gone over? Have I gone over? Oh, okay, I appreciate it. Uh, I want to end it, but I want to open it up for any final questions. Oh, one, I'm sorry. No, I do not. I want to do one more. Rita Ut. Ms. Ut is in our presence. Now, the reason I show her is I think if anyone exemplifies the Mexican experience in Fort Worth, it is Miss Ut. Mrs. Ut, excuse me. Mrs. Ut, she was recognized as one of the uh, Mujeres Poderosas, strong woman, by the Hispanic Women's Network. That's Rita. <laughs> when she was six years old. I don't know if you see her cousin here, Bobby. He wants to get on the horse, too. But they're in front of a store that was owned by her grandparents, Prisciliano and Dolores Rodriguez. They bought this building, and you'll see more of it. She was born, uh, raised in Worth Heights. Now, there's Prisciliano and her, that's her other grandma, grandmother, Dolores. They own this hotel restaurant in Hell's Half Acre in the 20s. See these guys here? They're Mexican workers. The Mexican workers couldn't find a place to eat or sleep. But they opened this restaurant and allowed them to come in and have a place. They were entrepreneurs. This is the store that they, uh, the building they bought. Uh, there was two stories. One side was like a kind of a, in those days, a 7-Eleven, and the other side was a pool hall, and they sold beer. And this is her father, Antonio, and this is Mike, her, her uncle. So they were entrepreneurs. This was in the Worth Heights area. This is them, Prisciliano and Dolores, and when they were a little bit older. And they lived on the second floor. Here's Rita when she was married. Now, why do I bring Rita here? Rita was one of these young ladies that was told she was not smart enough to do anything than become a secretary. That's the message she received throughout her education, that you are not smart enough. And besides, you don't have the money. She did not get the counseling. So she was channeled into less than professional. She ended up going to Trimble Tech, which is a good school, but channeled into a secretarial role. When she was in the eighth grade, a friend of hers got pregnant, who was in the eighth grade, and had twins and got married. That scared the bejeebus out of Rita. <laughs> she said, no way, no way, no way. So she was determined. Rita was smart. She liked school. She liked reading. And she was determined that she was going to have a better life. So she went on to nursing school, first to be an LBN. Then subsequently, she got an RN. She got married to this gentleman, Micah who happened to be an, a serviceman stationed in Carswell. That's where they met. Well, they got married, uh, to, un, uh, un, despite her father's displeasure that she was marrying an Anglo. He didn't like Anglos, but Rita, you know, true love. <laughs> so they fell in love and they stayed together. She went to Houston to be with him. In Houston, she decided she was gonna go to law school. She had just had her child. 
and he was struggling for work in Houston. But she was determined to stick it through and do it. Make a long story short, Rita persevered. It was hard. There were 400, um, there were 400 uh, students, I believe, and 40 of those were Latino. Half of them graduated. Half of the 40 graduated. She, she, gradu she was one of, the, one of the few Latinas in that school, law school. Graduated, struggled, faced a lot of hardships. And in spite of the fact that she didn't have the most excellent educational background, was still able to overcome and persevere and double down and get that degree. There's happily married. Here's Rita, attorney at law. She opened up her private practice. First she worked for the DAs, which was quite an experience, similar to the Judge Perez experience. She had the same experience. She was Latina. She was a woman. She was Latina. Two strikes against her in a, in a law office that was predominantly white male. But she persevered and survived, went on to open up her own private practice, and became a successful attorney. Rita Utt was truly a mujer poderosa, a powerful woman. Thank you, Rita, for your example. <laughs> this is Americo Perez. I just want to show you the people who contributed to it. This is Delsa Perez when she was queen. And this is Sam Garcia, who also contributed. Remember this picture? We saw Fort Worth from the TMP viewpoint. Let me show you it today. <laughs> this is the reality, looking from the courthouse back to TMP. That is the future, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.